Hello, this is Yaakov Fein with Farada Systems, and today we'll be talking about JavaScript. This is a part of our fifth Farada uh, Symposium on Software Development. About our company, we are an IT consultancy that works with all these different technologies. Mainly, it's enterprise application development for the web, Java in the middle, and whatever is on the front end, plus e-commerce with hybrids. Next comes JavaScript. First of all, the best kept secret is that if somebody will tell you that we will be doing HTML5 project, basically they mean that we will be developing, we will be spending 80% of our time uh, developing in JavaScript. Maybe with some frameworks, maybe without, but it's technically JavaScript. So in this presentation, we'll talk about JavaScript. The language was created by Brandon Icke from Netscape sometime back in 1995. It was originally named Mocha, then renamed to LiveScript and then to JavaScript. Microsoft, I don't know if copied is the right word, maybe they just ported it, they named it JScript. And the ECMAScript term is a name of the JavaScript standard. Currently, uh, the standard, uh, the, the fifth Java ECMAScript 5 was a is actually in action, so to speak, and they are working on the ECMAScript 6, which doesn't mean that everybody already implemented ECMAScript 5, of course. So why 17-year-old JavaScript became hot again? In my opinion, it's because this language fulfilled the promise right once run anywhere, at least for the front end on the web. This promise was made by another company about another language, but JavaScript technically runs anywhere uh, where you have a web browser without the need to install anything. So where people usually run JavaScript, the obvious place is your web browser, of course. But beside that, uh, the Google's engine, JavaScript engine V8 exists on the server and the popular framework like Node.js is uh, using JavaScript on the server side. I never worked with it, but the main selling point is you can uh, learn JavaScript only and use it on both front-end and uh, the server side. Uh, Java as a language also was including the JavaScript API, and uh, if you are a Java developer, then you can find this JRun script utility in your bin directory that is already there. The eighth version of Java will create, will come with a newer and faster JavaScript engine called Nashorn. So what is JavaScript? It's an interpreted language. It arrives to the place of execution as text. Typically, it's a part of your web page. Web browser makes a request, HTTP request, and the server side sends the text. This text can consist of text. Uh, maybe it, it's sprinkled with the different HTML tags. Maybe it has some CSS file for styling. And it may have JavaScript, pieces, fragments of code. And at the place of the execution, it gets, um, it, it is executed. So a compiler won't complain about any error. So if you are used to a controlled environment like Java, for example, and I am a Java developer, and uh, I will be pretty often give analogies with the Java environment or with Java features, because I know Java. But JavaScript is different. Don't expect that compiler is your friend. It's not. Compiler won't complain about your errors. Initially, many years ago, web browsers were created to be very forgiving. So they are trying to show whatever arrived, with or without errors, known or unknown. They try to show on the screen to the user. So they don't really care if you made a mistake in JavaScript, which makes it, which makes debugging a little bit easier. So what did I say? Easier, no. More complicated, of course, and longer. So don't assume that users have the same runtime environment as yours. If you are accustomed to working for or in some 
virtual machine like in Java, JVM, or maybe you are a Flex developer, so you you assume that you have this Flash player, which is a known runtime. Don't be expecting the same luxury over here. You don't know where your JavaScript will uh, run. For example, Facebook uh, stated, at least I, I've heard it on one of the presentations, that people access their application from 2,500 different in different devices. 2,500, think about it. And uh, do you know of any other language that you can use that supports 2,500 different devices? I don't. So runtime is different everywhere. Developing in Java is pretty predictable. And the Java virtual machine is a reliable foundation. Your program lives I would say in the same environment, no matter where you where the JVM is installed. Maybe it's not a hundred percent true statement, but at least ninety nine percent, pretty solid. In case of JavaScript, you are not you're not exactly sure where you are. It is a foundation. It is a web browser. Most likely, your program will work, but you have to you have to always worry about it. What if this browser doesn't implement this feature? So it is a little bit shaky, I would say, but it's livable. What are the browsers, today's browsers, and market penetration? As you can see from this diagram, which I took from this statistic, all you can see the URL at the bottom of the slide. If you want to see the latest statistics, go there and, and see for yourself. Internet Explorer is still about half of the market. And uh, Firefox, Chrome, and Safari is the rest. The situation is different, of course, on the mobile devices. This is more, more of a desktop situation. On mobile devices, everything is better. Everything is more modern. But you have to live, especially if you are an enterprise developer, you have to live uh, in this world that you, you see over here. So testing, testing, testing. Make sure that your JavaScript works everywhere. IDEs, where do you write your JavaScript? Uh, of course, you can use Eclipse if you are a Java developer, for example. If you are using different languages, they also have their version of uh, IDEs for JavaScript. For example, Microsoft Visual Studio is there, of course. Uh, Ruby developers have their own uh, IDE and so on. Uh, JetBrains, again, if you're a Java developer, they have a nice little nice uh, IDE called IntelliJ IDE, excellent IDE. But if you are not Java developer, they, they can give you, not give you, they can sell you for $50 or so. WebStorm, which is a nice IDE just specifically for JavaScript. If you don't want to pay even a dime, just get this Aptana Studio, which is a free Eclipse-based IDE for JavaScript. Debugging. Debugging is greatly improved uh, for JavaScript over the last several years. Firefox, you can um, install an add-on, it takes a second to install, called Firebug. Excellent tool, excellent. You can debug your JavaScript right inside your browser. So you're dealing with, um, mm, you can put breakpoints, you can see what's in there, you can uh, examine HTML, you can examine CSS, uh, you can see all these variables you, that you created in JavaScript. You can monitor network and so on. Chrome's development developer tools do the same thing. Excellent tool. And the uh, Internet Explorer also has it. And Safari has it. So debugging-wise, it is not bad. It is not bad. JavaScript in the web page. Where do you put it? A simple HTML page consists of the head section and the body section. As a matter of fact, any HTML page typically consists of these two sections. If you are just using JavaScript and no frameworks, then put it at the end of the body tag, the very latest. By this, by this time, all other content of your page, such as HTML and uh, CSS, will already uh, will arrive already to the browser, so when your script will be mm, running, all these objects will be already here 
in the browser. If you are using uh, frameworks, play by their rules, read their manuals and see where they want you to put JavaScript. Uh, so kind of extreme example you can see on this screen, it's uh, from the framework called XJS by Sencha. Take a look at this, look at this body section of this HTML document, it's, it's empty. A creator of this excellent framework called XJS, they completely wrote everything, uh, all components, instantiation of all components, uh, they created an excellent library of components and they do everything on their own. So basically you load their library and uh, this app JS is your starting point for the application for JavaScript. So they say that you have to put it in the head section. So my point is read the manual for the framework and you will figure out where to put your JavaScript. Variables. First of all, JavaScript is a dynamic language, loosely typed language. You don't worry about variable types. JavaScript will figure it out on its own. So declaring a variable is optional. In this example, you see girlfriend name is equal Mary. Just because this Mary is in double quotes, JavaScript will figure it out that it's a string. And if you develop girlfriend name, if you, sorry, if you declare a variable without this keyword var, without var, this variable becomes global. Yes, in JavaScript there is this global space and uh, you should be careful about it because if, if you forget about this var keyword, then your variable will be gl global. If you will declare a variable with var inside a function, then your variable is local. Here's an example. Function calculate salary. Inside you can see we declare the variable address, which is a string local. Variable address is local. See this var? Age is global because I forgot to put this keyword var. Then I, I do var married is equal true. It's Boolean. And the next line I write married is equal and something in double quote. So after this line, married is not Boolean anymore. It's a string. Objects. Objects and functions. Um, as a matter of fact, this presentation was created based on my uh, one day workshop that I teach. And when I teach this workshop, when originally I created this curriculum, I was not sure what to explain first, object or function. Because they rely on each other and uh, in the end, I decided, let me, let me talk about them together at the same time. Functions are different in JavaScript than in Java. Again, I'm using the uh, comparison with Java, but if you are a C++ or C Sharp programmer, it's, uh, it's the same, basically. All these object-oriented languages, they show the same behavior. You, in, in those languages you have classes, you have methods. This includes, by the way, ActionScript 3 if you are a Flex or Flash developer. So in Java, classes can have methods, which is behavior. Some of them are invoked with instantiation of the object based on the class. Some of them are invoked on the class itself, such as static methods. In JavaScript, you don't have any classes. You can declare a function that doesn't belong to any object and you can invoke this function. You can create an instance of the function, which is something unusual. How can you create an instance of function? Yes, in JavaScript you can do this. In JavaScript, functions are object. Moreover, you can create an instance of a function, assign it to a variable, or give it to another function and execute it there. So functions are objects, just keep it in mind. And there is, it gets even worse. Functions have memory. And I'll talk about it a bit later when I'll be talking about closures. How do you declare and invoke a function? Simple. Function called text, couple of arguments in this case, income and dependent, and that's it. No need to declare return type. 
No need to declare data types of arguments, just like this. How do you invoke this function, calc text? Calc text and gives the values, 50,000, for example, for, need, for income and uh, two for dependents. If you will pass more or less parameters than you define in the function declaration, it's still okay. JavaScript won't complain. So if you will pass more, it'll ignore them. If you will pass less, they will have undefined values. And uh, there is something else. You can cre declare a function that will instantiate itself. As you can see over here, I put a function declaration inside the parentheses. And right after that, I am using an extra pair of parentheses over here. And uh, this basically declares the function and execute it right there. And cr technically, it's create an object based on what the function will return. Literal functions. This is an example of an anonymous function that is assigned to a variable. So on the right hand side of the equal sign you see a, a function declaration which will be assigned to a variable do tax in my case and then you can call this function by name. So on the right hand side uh, you have this expression or an anonymous function which is assigned to the variable. Unusual, right? On a similar note, if you have an object that is represented in my case, in my example, by a variable my customer, and if it has a property do text, so my customer do text is equal, and then you put a function uh, de declaration, so that function declaration will be assigned to a property do text of my customer, and later on you can invoke it as my customer dot do text. And the weirdest part is for people who are not used to dynamic uh, programming languages. In this example, do text may never be defined in the object my customer. So if it wasn't, it will be created now. Objects versus classes. First of all, there is no classes in, in JavaScript. In Java, you have classes. You define a class, you create its instance, one or more. But in JavaScript, you just can think of objects. No classes, but objects. You can create objects using object literals. You can use a function create on the special object. This object with capital O is a root of the hierarchy of everything in JavaScript. This uh, function create may or may not be implemented in some older browsers, but even if it's not, you can write your own function to construct objects. You can use constructor functions and instantiate them with the keyword new. Let's look at the object literals. Think of an object as a hash map, where the key is a string and the value can be of any type. In this example, the first line var t is equal empty curly braces is instantiation of an empty object. And the variable t is pointing at this object, which is located somewhere in memory. The next line var a is equal some value 125 is creating another object with a property some value which has a value of 125. Please note the column over here, not equal sign, but, but column. The next example creates an instance of a object person with three properties, last name, first name, and age. How do you access these properties of the person? It's, uh, s first of all, you can use the dot notation, person dot last name, or you can use these uh, square brackets, as in here, as in uh, her name is equal person brackets and last name, name of the property. 
object methods. If you will create these, if you will declare an object as a literal, you can also define in there methods. When a function is defined, is defined inside an object, we call it a method. Somewhat similar to object-oriented languages. In this example, we've added to Julia Roberts, we've added, a, actually we've added a method make appointment to a person object, right? It happened to be for Julia Roberts. And uh, after the person is created, then we say person dot make appointment. I'm calling a method on the person. Please note after this 42, uh, note this comma. You declare properties in this object, so uh, regular variables are properties of the object as well as a function is a property of this object. And you list them uh, using comma separated uh, syntax. Nested objects. You can nest one object inside the other object using this literal notation. As you can see here, I've added phones. Phones is sitting inside the person. Phones object is sitting inside the person. Every person can have one or more phones. And you may want to create an object called phones. And uh, there are different properties in this object, like work phone and cell phone. So to exit nested, sorry, to access the nested object, you're using dot notation. So person dot phones dot work will return you a two one two five 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 one two one two. How do you create multiple instances using object literals? If you are just using object literals, you cannot create uh, more than one instance using this notation. You need to create a function that will do this, some kind of uh, object factory, so, so to speak. So in this example, create person var new person. Uh, see this line declares the, it lines, this line declares the empty, empty object. Then it assigns, on the fly it creates a property first name and assign an empty string in there. Then it adds a function to this new person, and then it returns this object. So here's an example that you can use to create more than one instance of an object. In this case, I'm, I'm creating uh, two instances. One of them will be, can be referred to using the variable person1 and the other one person2. It's not the best way of uh, creating multiple instances. I don't like the fact here that we've declared a method inside the object. This will cause a method duplication. So every instance will have the declaration of this method, which is not nice, and we'll, we'll fix it later. But for now, just let's live with this. Constructor functions. Here's an example of, from Java. You have a class tax this constructor, named the same way, right? And then it has some main method, maybe, and uh, we create a couple of instances of this class. This is a Java class with a constructor. In JavaScript, you don't need a class. You, you can't have a class, but you can have a constructor. So function, text, and some arguments in my case, and curly braces. So this function can be if you want to use it as a constructor function, you have to create instances of this function with a new keyword. Typically, when we want to, to create object uh, using these construction function, functions, we call these functions with capital letter, like you see capital T in here. So in this case, I created two instances of an object text, with different values, of course, I passed different values to the constructors, and uh, these two instances can be referred to later on using the variables t1 and t2. Arrays in JavaScript, uh, a grab bag of anything. You can put anything in there. In this example, I put several strings in there, but I could have created, I could have put in there not only uh, the values, but I could put in there functions as well. 
Specifying size of the array is optional when you create it. And here is an example which, with, which stores not only the string hello, this mixed array, but it also stores a function, function prompt, which is supposed to ask you for your name. If you will do alert mix array join, join basically is supposed to join every object from this array, then it will execute the function, ask your name, uh, and you type your name and you will see as an output hello Mary, if your name is Mary, of course. Inheritance. JavaScript is object-oriented language, so you can use inheritance in there, but it's done differently. Uh, it's done using not something as we know by now, classical inheritance as we use in Java, in C Sharp, in C++, where we say class A or class B extends A. And then you can create instances of A or B. In JavaScript, it's different. There is this secret property, not exactly secret, but it's not explicitly declared. You don't have to explicitly declare it. And this property is called prototype. And the inheritance is called accordingly a prototypal inheritance. So say for example you have an object A and you have an object B. When I say object, think of constructor functions. And they don't depend on each other. So if you want to establish a hierarchy or inheritance, you can just say B dot prototype is equal A. In this example, if you will do this, you say that your object B becomes inherited from your object A. Let's look at the example to understand it better. Let's assume that we have two constructor functions. One is person and the other one is employee. They are not related in any way. The person takes two arguments, the person can have subordinates, right? And it has, has three properties, name, title, and an array for subordinates. For the employee, I decided to create just two properties, name and title, nothing else. Now I can make an employee a subclass of a person just by saying employee dot prototype is equal new person. Simple, right? And now, if I will create a new instance of an object employee, passing Mary and specialist, it'll create an instance of this object. And if you want to refer to a property in this object that is not declared in this object, JavaScript will try to go up the prototype chain. It'll try to see, you want to refer to a property of the employee. Do I have it declared in the employee function? If not, it'll try to see what is the prototype of the employee? Oh, it's person. Let me see maybe person function or object has this property declared. But in my example, we have, let me go back a slide, we have name and title declared in two ways, in two places, sorry, in employee and in person. So this will create a weird situation when I have two pairs of name and title in the employee object as well as in person object. It's not the same as in Java where you would declare these properties in person only and this, you would have only one pair of name and title. If you'd be running uh, this script through a fire bug, add-on to Firefox, and see this little bug on the left? It's a, the logo. You can put, put breakpoints over here for the script. You can run it, you can step over, step into, and so on. Just like with any regular debugger. In my example, I put a breakpoint on line number 13 over here, this red bullet, and I step through to line number 16, console.log is just an output to the debugger's console. 
But on the right hand side, I can watch all these variables that I have available now. And uh, they have also this concept of this object. Look at this. I have an object EMP, right? On the line number 14 on the left, I created an instance of it. And what do I have in there? I have a property name, property subordinates, which came from the superclass, from the ancestor, right? From person. I never declared a property subordinate in the employee, but it's visible. And I have title. On the other hand, on the other hand, the employee has person as a prototype, right? And person itself, as you can see above, has name and title and subordinates. So I have redundant definitions of these pairs. How to fix that, I'll explain pretty soon. Objects have properties and methods, right? A function, as I said in JavaScript, is an object, right? Hence, functions can have properties and methods. Weird, right? It sounds weird. Functions can have properties and methods. Get used to it. Let's look at this function text. What do we have? A couple of properties, income and dependence. In, in here, I'm using this. Since this is sitting inside the function, it'll refer to the instance of this object text, this particular object. And also what I have, I create on the fly do taxes as a property, and I assign a function to this property, which will take 5% of the income and deduct dependence multiplied by 500. So we are assigning anonymous function to a variable. So we will be calling this variable by name do Texas now. And as a matter of fact, this is the only way you can call it. It's the only name that is known. So instantiation of the object text with values 50,003 is here. T1 will point at this object. And then you can call a method on this object do Texas to calculate your Texas. Private variables, can you hide, can you encapsulate data inside the object? Yes, you can. Let's see, function text has a couple of variables, income and dependence, and I declare the variable mafia text deduction. Let's assume that I am an accountant with ties to mafia. Remember Sopranos from HBO? And if my friend from mafia will come to calculate taxes, we want to apply this special extra discount of uh, $300. So I declare a variable mafia tax deduction inside the function tax. Remember, I, I said in the beginning, since I'm using var over here, this mafia tax deduction is local variable. It has local scope. It's visible only inside this function tax. Think of it as a private variable of tax. What else I did? I also declared the do taxes property with anonymous function, which will uh, calculate the tax, your tax using this extra property of your deduction. Down there, I show you how you create an instance of this tax, how you can call a method tax. A method is declared on the, this object, so it's exposed to the rest of the world on the object tax. On the other hand, if you will try to access Mafia text deduction on T1, you'll get undefined. You can't see it from outside because it was declared as a variable var. It's private. Or here you can see an example from uh, running it through Firebug. See the Mafia text deduction is undefined. Where can you declare or where should you declare methods? As I said before, declaring methods right inside the function can cause method redundancy or duplications. Every instance will repeat the code of the method, as in this example. 
function person has uh, three properties and uh, method add subordinates. If you will create a couple of instances as below P1 and P2, each of these objects will have declaration of the add subordinate function, which is not nice. So what you should do? You should declare this add subordinates not inside the person, but on its prototype. Let me go back a slide. In this slide, I, I declare the function on this object. But in this slide, this is proper way of doing this, I am declaring on the prototype of the person function. If I do that, the method will not be duplicated, regardless of how many instances you will create. So uh, declaring methods on the prototype is the right way to go. Method overriding. Since JavaScript is an object-oriented language, how do we override a method declared in the superclass? Sorry, 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 no classes in the super object, in the prototype object. That's correct. So person has only properties in there. Method is declared on the prototype. I'm talking about add subordinate. And what if I don't like this method and I want to override it on a particular instance. I create an instance of a uh, new person, p1 points at this instance, and then if I will declare a function, a method, on this uh, p1 with the same signature as in person, I literally I am overriding add subordinate. So overriding works in here. A little bit different notation, but not nothing fancy, nothing too complicated. Function overloading, it's even easier. In Java or in C Sharp, you would need to write something like this, class text and uh, several function declarations with different uh, method signatures. In this example, I'm declaring two methods called text, one which takes two arguments and the other which takes three. In JavaScript, you don't even need to worry about it. Just declare a function with whatever number of arguments you want. If you will call this function with less arguments, fine. It'll work. Just write the property, write the processing inside, well, as, as in my example. I'm checking if uh, the state argument was not given to me if not state, then maybe I'll assume that state is New York. By doing this, I allow developers to call my function called text either with three parameters or with two. Every function has these functions. How, what, how do I say it properly? Every function object has these methods, probably. To string, apply, and call. ToString is known in probably most of the object-oriented languages, a string representation of an object. If you will not provide a method on your object that is called ToString, then if you will decide to print this object, you will see this string, object, object, in brackets. Meaning, I don't know what, you, what to print. You were supposed to tell me how to print your object. I don't know. So unless you will override the function to string, you will see this object object. Also, it has two very important and interesting functions. One of them is called apply, and the other one is called call. It, both of these have the same functionality. They allow any, they allow to call any function on any object. I'll explain it in detail. But the difference between them is that apply expect you to specify the arguments in the form of an array, while call expect you to specify parameters as a comma separated list. I'll explain you what are they for pretty soon. Let's look at this example first. Say you have a function x, y, z. 
And this function, you want, and you want to call this function on a specific method. You declare the function x, y, z without tying it to any specific object. But now you decided, I want to call x, y, z, and I want to use my tax object as a context for this function. So notation looks like this. x, y, z dot call then you specify the context for this object, sorry, for this function, call, for the x, y, z. You're saying, I want you to live or to run inside my object. And I'm giving you two arguments, 50,000 and three, in comma-separated list. If you wanted to do the same thing with apply, you would have given the arguments as an array. See these red uh, square brackets? If you don't want to specify any context, you can specify null in here. So just keep in mind this is a different notation. We'll use it again pretty soon. So calling a function on any arbitrary object. And how to understand it? I can just tell you how I figured out what it means. Hopefully this analogy will work for you too. A couple of years ago, I was teaching a class at NASA, and I was really impressed by what they showed. They showed this huge uh, space station, and shuttle comes to the station uh, every now and then bringing supplies and maybe bringing people, taking them back, and so on. If you think about it, think about this NASA space station as an object, and function is like a freely moving vehicle. If you want to apply this function on a particular object, you stick to it and you say, now you're going to be living inside this object. Then you can apply the same function to a different object. So technically, it's like a delegation. Delegation of a functionality to different objects. Let's look at another example. And this is something that is known in most probably object-oriented languages, and especially if you are uh, into UI development, callbacks. Callback is not a function that you call, but it's a function that is called by someone else. Or, as we can say, it's a function that you can give to another function to execute. Callbacks. Let's take a look at this example. Say, for example, I want to be able to have an array, and I want to be able to pass. Oh, no, let me put it this way. I want to have a function that will be a processor of an array. And I want to specify to this function an array to be processed, and which function should be processed this array? So I want to give an, an object and its processor dynamically during the runtime. As in this example, let's look at it. First of all, I declare a function apply handlers to array with two arguments. First argument in my example will be an array. Whatever your array you pass to this uh, function, will be acted upon. And second argument of type of function, name of the function, please note, I didn't specify uh, parentheses over here. Name of some function that should be applied to an object. So both things, an object and its processor, I'm passing as arguments. Then I run a loop, for a loop. I'm look looping through this array and I want to call the function that was given to me as a second argument. So our call API comes handy. I am applying to the second argument. I know the name of the function, and I want to call it, passing this as a context. And in this example, uh, an array for processing. Say I had an array with a content of one, two, three. And uh, I, I invoke this function. In step number one, I declare the function apply handlers to array. 
And in step number two, I invoke it. Apply handlers to array, and I'm passing the first argument an array, and the second, the red one. I'm passing a function. See, I'm passing a function to a function. I want this second argument to look like this. Console log hello from callback. Processing the value. If you will run this example, you will get this hello from a callback, processing value one, two, three. Think about it. We are passing a second argument. We are giving a second argument as a function. A callback. A piece of code is given to another function for processing. Functions can have properties. Functions are objects, right? They can have properties. In this example, I have a function text with a couple of arguments, and I assign uh, the arguments to the properties of the object, and I write a log statement on the console of the web inspector, development tools for Firebox, whatever I use in the browser. And I want to print something. What is this something? In bold, I show you how you can assign any properties to a function. A function text was declared over here, and in the middle of the slide, I decided that I want to have maybe default values which will be used in my accounting application. Text.default is equal object. And I, assi I assume that if the state is not given, I assume it's Florida, and if the language is not given of the customer, I assume that it's Spanish. And I attach these properties to the function. When you will be creating instances of these uh, objects, they already have the properties, state Florida and the language Spanish. So the console log, if you will print income, dependence, and so on, text.defaults.state will print you FL, and lang language will print you Spanish. So you keep these properties right where the function is. It can serve, it can save you some time when, especially when you process DOM. Document object model is a place where all HTML elements are sitting inside the browser. So instead of trying to find an object inside the DOM, you can find them and maybe you can store them as properties of your function. Next comes comparison of what Java has. Java has anonymous classes. In this example, say you have a button and you want to assign a listener to the button. So if somebody will click on the button, you will process it. In Java, you cannot just simply assign a function as a listener to the button. The only thing you can do, you can create so-called inner class. And so right there, new action listener. So technically, you are defining an inner class, anonymous inner class, which has one method, action perform. This is what you need to do in Java. In JavaScript, you don't need to do this. In JavaScript, it's pretty simple. You have a button on the screen. You can say add event listener, which event you want to listen. And right there, you can pass to this function another function, similar to what we had uh, a minute ago when, when, I, when I talked about callbacks. Add event listener is a function with two arguments. As a second argument in this example, I pass the processor what to do if somebody will click on this button. Easy. Easy, easy, easy. Now let's talk about closures. Closures is something that is not well understood in many cases. Examples are not maybe that easy. Probably the best, the best definition of a closure that I found in the literature was by an author, Larry Ullman. Closure is a function call with memory. Think about it. Not a function with memory, but a function call. This particular call has memory. It remembers something. What it remembers, I'll explain in a minute. And I 
can give you another definition, my own. Closure is a function call with strings attached. And this is an analogy that I can think of. String attached. You are calling a function, but it has something attached to it somewhere. It remembers something. Oracle promised that Java 8 will also support closures. If you are a Java developer, look at this JSR. Let's look at some examples. First of all, let's look at the top. As you can see, we start with the um, parentheses. If you see a word function in a, in a row, somewhere written in, uh, in your code, and if, if the word, if, it do, if the line doesn't start with the letter F, but it starts with something else, it's a hint to JavaScript engine that it's an expression. It's not going to be just a function declaration. And in this case, it, it starts with paren, which, which, which hints JavaScript engine that you will need to calculate something now. You will need to evaluate an expression. And at the end of this declaration, we have another pair of parentheses. We are invoking immediately self-invoked function. It'll create something in memory right away. What exactly is going to create? Let's look at it. First of all, since you don't see any name on the top line in this slide, we can ex assume, safely assume, that this is an anonymous function. True. And now think of what the browser will do. Browser will see, oh, I need to evaluate some expression, and it'll start reading this text, not only reading, and it'll start interpreting it interpreting in line by line. Function, you, there's a variable declaration, 500, right? Some private variable, remember this var? And then we have another function, function sitting inside the function. It's a, and it's going to be a closure that is exposed to the rest of the world. First of all, remember this. If you are using the word closure, it means that you have a situation with a nested function, a function sitting inside another function. So the function do Texas was declared inside this anonymous function, this one in red. The, the, this red thing is a closure. So if you remember, I said that this the closure remembers something. What it remembers, let's see. It remembers the, vari the value, in my case, of a variable tax deduction. This variable was declared outside of this nested function in red. But when the function in red was declared, it was there, right? So if you will just be calling from outside th this red piece of code, even though inside this red code there is no declaration of the variable tax deduction, you can still use it. So this is what I mean when I talk about the memory of the function call. We are assigning this function that calculate text. Again, this function will calculate text differently. If you are a godfather, you, you will, they will use one formula with some... Um, Mm, uh, tax deduction, which is using tax deduction, it'll deduct extra 500 for Godfather. Uh, actually, if it's if you are not Godfather, you will be using this formula. If you are, then you will be using formula. You will be calling a private function Mafia Special. Why it's private? Because this function is sitting inside the anonymous function and it's not exposed. When I say it's not exposed. Why it's not exposed? Because it was not assigned to this. I said this dot do taxes. I create technically a property on the object, on the blue object, which is visible from outside. And I can call do taxes from outside. On the other hand, Mafia Special, it's a private function declared inside another function. 
So do Texas can see it and can use it. But from outside you can't call Mafia Special. It's a secret function. So think about it this way. The blue code and the blue function is like, a, like this cloud in the sky with one exposed button, do Texas. So technically, when you will be calling do Texas, look at this line. We are outside of the function declaration, right? We call do Texas 10,000 John Smith or do Texas 10,000 or it's 100,000, right? Godfather. We are calling the red piece of code, only whatever is in, in red. But this red will have access to the context. When this red function was born, it remembers that there was a neighbor called John, and it remembers something about this neighbor and so on. Memories from, from childhood. Uh, later on, I, I, I show you another example. I'm using set timeout to call a function later. So I'm saying call in two seconds the function do Texas. Uh, Mary, uh, I mean 50,000 and Mary Lou to, to calculate Texas. I call this function later, not in this, uh, not in this, not in this moment. But even though I call the function later, it still has access to do to text deduction. And uh, finally, on this last line, I, I'm calling Mafia Special, which will give you an error, because Mafia Special is not defined. It was private. It's not exposed to the rest of the world. Next example. Also, pretty typical example of using closure. You are returning a closure. Let's see. Say, for example, you have a declaration of function person. Again, function, it's a constructor function. And um, we will be using prototypes for declaring something on it. On the left hand side, I want to declare a method do Texas. I do it on the prototype for person, right? So what do I do? I, I attach to it an anonymous function in black, basically similar to what I had, right? Which has text deduction, has private function, but now what I do, I am returning a closure. In the previous example, the previous slide, I just had this dot do text is equal whatever in red. So I was exposing a closure to the rest of the world. But in this example, I am returning it. Let's see what happens. When your JavaScript engine, say browser, the ones that comes with your web browser, start getting this code and start executing. And it'll see, somebody wants me to add a property do Texas to the prototype of a person. It start to execute, start executing these lines. Oh, it's a function, fine. Uh, they want this function to have tax deduction and there's some private function fine. Oops. And they hit this return statement. Oh, they understand. I need to return something and whatever I will return will be assigned to do Texas. So what do, you, what do they want me to return? They want me to return some function that will take income, will do some calculations and return text. So basically, after this code is done, the property do Texas has this blue piece of code. Blue piece of code, the closure, is assigned to do Texas. And in this example on the right, I, I instantiate P1, new person equal, sorry, new person John Smith, and I call a method do Texas on P1 with 100,000 as an income. What will be executed? Do Texas is basically whatever you have in the blue code. 100k will come through this argument, will be used inside, and see, P1 do Texas is executing a blue code, but inside the blue code I don't have tax deduction, right? Regardless of that, it was in the context when the blue code was declared, so that closure can use it still. 
If you will be using, uh, say, Chrome's developer's tools, to, uh, similar debugger to Firebug, you can see it. You can see it right away. If you, for example, put a breakpoint in this line, then you can see the variables. You can see that, in this example, income is 100k. This points to a person. Your text is undefined at this point when I'm standing on line number 22 on the left. And it says that you have a closure, right? Closure that uh, something that you can see the method do Texas can see and use. Now let's talk about JavaScript in the browser. Most likely you're going to be using some frameworks. There's a lot, there are tons of JavaScript framework and they are useful and you'll figure out which one to use. But for now, in this presentation, we are not talking about any JavaScript framework. We'll just uh, see how you can do this processing of HTML elements that are a part of a web page using uh, pure JavaScript. In your browser, you have this DOM object and you have some global object that is called window. It's implicit object that you don't, have in, you don't even have to declare, but you can always use it. So this window object has such property as location, for example, where this page came from. If you are looking at uh, google.com, so location will have this value. Uh, document, document is a reference to this DOM object. It's a tree structure that uh, you can, that browser builds based on your content. For example, you have some divs on the page, maybe uh, some forms and so on. So everything goes in there, in that DOM tree. A large part of the code is done uh, by, done trying to find the elements inside the DOM tree, maybe change the elements of, in the DOM tree, maybe change their values, maybe change their styles. This part is slow. If somebody will tell you that JavaScript is slow, most likely they mean that using JavaScript to work with DOM is slow. That's correct, but JavaScript itself is not slow. But working with DOM is slow. So open the property if you are opening a window for, uh, and uh, these, uh, the window that opens the second window is an, will be stored in the property opener. Uh, then a parent, uh, if you're using frames or iframes, who is a parent of the iframe? Cookies, of course, browser supports cookies. So if a page has a cookie, uh, there is a property cookie in there. This is pretty simple stuff. But what uh, is happening in the web browser? The browser is uh, receiving some content from the server side. It's an, an HTTP request and the HTTP content comes in. And it always goes in cycles. First, the browser adds this DOM, adds the elements to the DOM if it's an HTML element that is coming in. It may try to lay, lay it out. Maybe layout done is some CSS, I don't know, maybe not. Then it's try to render UI. What if some events are happening under the hood? It's trying to process the event. What if a piece of script has arrived, JavaScript? And it goes, it runs in circles and circles and circles all the time. Document object model, as I said before, it's a tree structure. And document builds this uh, structure based on the content that arrives from, uh, from the server as a part of your uh, HTML page as it loads. The DOM object was created somewhere in 1995 and uh, it was, of course, nobody could foresee that people will create such powerful and complicated web pages using JavaScript and HTML. So it's not very optimized, I would say, for the current web pages. And different web different vendors of web browsers, they treat them differently. Some of them would create text node for spaces, for example, or a line break. Some wouldn't. So if you will need to traverse the DOM, you'll need to take into consideration these things. Is there a text node representing a, a 
line feed or maybe it's not. Typically, most likely, you're going to be using JavaScript frameworks which already take care of this. But what if not? You just need to remember that there are some differences and you would need to, to worry about that. The good uh, news is that uh, there are, again, when you will be using frameworks or maybe you will be using some minification tools, as they call it, when you go in production, you want to say, I want to remove all comments, I want to remove all these white spaces from my uh, HTML uh, content. So when you will deploy this way using these minifiers, hopefully your code or your HTML content will not have anything that is not needed to minimize the load on the DOM. In Firebug or in any other debugger, of course, you can uh, examine the DOM and you can see what's in there. As you can see over here, see this text node for just for backslash and line feed. It, it has created a, new, a node. Over here, it has H1 header for the first level, right? Then header for the second level and so on. Traversing the DOM. Uh, of course, uh, the DOM consists of nodes and you can, uh, you can write a function that will be processing DOM and you start with the with whatever node you want to use as a parent and you go down the tree trying to find all children of this node. It's a, like a recursive function that calls itself if it'll find it'll find children in the current node. There is something called first child, you can find siblings siblings and so on. All this is available, of course, and well documented. In general, there is ton of documentation on JavaScript, and it's pretty good. Working with DOM, what are you going to do with DOM? Document, as I said, represent DOM object. Uh, in older in older books, you may find these examples. If you want to to add something to the page, just use write. Uh, it's not really a best way to do things because uh, as I said HTML, doc, HTML content comes in from the server and uh, today's pages are consisting of different uh, different pieces of script different scripts or maybe different includes of different scripts and you write text into a dome what if not all HTML has arrived yet, and the new arrivals will overwrite your will overwrite your text that you already written to the to the document. There is something called create uh, create element, and uh, you can you can create elements uh, in a better or more safe way. What you will do most likely, you will try to find elements inside the DOM. In this example get element by ID, if uh, an HTML element has an ID, you may if you can say find me an element, give me a reference to it. Why do you find it? And of course you want to change it, or maybe you want to get a value of this document, sorry, of this element. Or if you know a tag name, like show me, get me all elements which has tag div, for example, or form. In this case, you will have a list of nodes, many. Or if you have a name, get elements by name. Or if you are using some styles, CSS, for example, and you have a class name in there, class selector. So find me every element that has a style of this name. Here's an example, you can select an element by ID. There's a span over here with ID EMP. You can find it and, and assign its value to replace these dots with something else. Maybe I want to, to set employee of the month. Document.getElementById, I'll get a reference to this span, which has an ID EMP, right? And then I find the child the first child of this element, and I assign John Smith as its node value, replacing these dots. Inner HTML, it's a property that is used uh, quite often, and here's, here's an example. Say, for example, uh, I want to 
create dynamically on the page. I want to create image element. Document.create element. I, I'm creating a new element, IMG. Right? I have a reference over here. And then I assign the property to the property inner HTML, whatever I want to to be there. IMG, SRC, and so on, and the particular picture. And when this is done, I append a child. This document, this element that I created, that is represented by EMP image variable, I use and I append it to the body. In this case, I, app I append it to the body section. Uh, it doesn't have to be to the body section. You, you can do more granular, you can append it to any other container that you have inside the page. Styles. Uh, say, for example, you have a styles, you can have a style se selectors. You say you are loading CSS file, my style CSS. And you assign uh, this class nice style that was declared inside of that CSS file to some some div. And uh, you, if you have something like this, you can um, refer to these styles. As in this example, you can say, find me all the elements on the page that have class name named nice style. So you will get a reference to this div, right? This div billing info has a reference, has a class uh, named nice style. And then later on you're saying, I want to change it. I find nice style. And if I have only one element with this style, I, I just use index zero of the collection. And I say that I want your class name to be bad style. Of course, I assume that you have bad declaration of the bad style in that CSS file or somewhere else. So this is an example how you can change the styling of a div, in my case, or any other element. Now let's talk quickly about events. Of course, it's an event-driven environment, web browser. Different events are happening uh, when you are loading, not you, the browser loads the application, for example, load, unload, a user moves the mouse, user clicks on the button, and so on. And uh, there's something called event uh, target. If you click on the button, the button is a target for the event. If you want to process this click, then you assign a function, an event handler, to process the click if, and only if, of course, the user will click on this event. You can invoke the function like this, for example, declarative way on click equal my function handler, whatever is your function that you write in JavaScript. Uh, there is another way to do this. You can assign these handlers programmatically in JavaScript, not like in the previous slide, inside the component, but programmatically add event listener click what is the function to call and false for capturing stage, I'll, I'll tell you in a minute. And then, basically, in, in front of this ad, uh, event listener, you can, mm, you need to s specify an ID of that button, maybe, like my button in this case, that uh, has to be uh, using this function handler. So technically, this notation is a replacement of what we have on top. There is something called event bubbling and event capturing. Event bubbling is uh, the following. When you click on the button, and if the button is happen to be sitting inside of the other container, say inside the div, and div was sitting inside the uh, page, the body, then the event will bubble up. So you can declare event listeners on the container's levels as well, and the container will get notifications that this event happened. Even though you clicked on the button, the button being a target, will receive the event, but later on the event will bubble all the way up to the topmost container. If you want to put processing over there, you can do that. On the other hand, event capturing is capturing event on the way to the target, not after the target is processed, but before. Same example, if you have a body tag, inside the body you have div, inside the div you have a button. 
you click on the button uh, as event travels from the body to the div and later on to the button this this is called capturing stage and capturing stage is um, if you want to process capturing event on the capturing stage, you, can, you have to turn it on. You have to specify, I want to add event listener and, and I want it to work on the capturing stage. As an example, why, would you, why you might want to have something like this. If you have a calculator, for example, you can, as, and this calculator has a, a bunch of buttons, one, two, three, four, five, and so on. Instead of assigning a listener to every button, you can assign a listener to the container that has all these buttons, and uh, then in one place you can process the clicks. You can analyze there what button was clicked and what to do in this case. Here in the, here's a function, eval. Eval function is called evil function. People say don't use function evolve because it can be dangerous. Let's see what it does in general and then we'll see if it's too dangerous or no. It's very easy to do any evaluation of any expression in JavaScript using this function evolve. Say I want to create a calculator which will take any expression. You press the button and it calculates your expression, any formula. In uh, object-oriented language like Java or C Sharp, it would be a pretty involving task to figure out, to parse, and to decide what is this. In our case, in case of JavaScript, it's piece of cake. What you can do, you can use the function eval, and you can give it an expression, any expression, any JavaScript, any valid JavaScript, if you give to eval, it'll execute it. Let's look at this code. I have a function calculate in JavaScript, right? And if a user will click on a button calculate, I call the function calculate. Easy. Then what I do, I, what do I do inside the function calculate? I say, give me an element by ID expression. What is this expression? It's right there. It's input type text. This is an expression. Then I say, give me an element which, is, which has an ID result. And I, I, I'm getting a reference to calc result. This is an area where you see 250. This is a place where the result should go. Right there, it's pan. For now it's empty in the beginning, but then this 250 in my example will be placed right there. And then what? Then I say, evaluate for me whatever you see in the user input field. It'll take, JavaScript will take this formula that the user entered, evaluate it, and assign to this pen, uh, to this pen, as an inner HTML. Easy. It's very simple. But people say it's dangerous. Why? What if some bad guy will intercept your code, especially if it's come from somewhere else, from the server side, and will replace this innocent uh, expression with some malicious code? Eval will, uh, of course, do its job, and it will evaluate it, and it, it will do whatever that bad code was uh, written to do. Uh, is it bad? Maybe, in some cases, maybe, but can you blame a knife if you cut your finger? I don't know. I don't think so. It is there, but just know that it may be dangerous if you use it in a non-secure environment, so to speak. And that's about it for today. Uh, I just want to recommend you a couple of books. I think I've been using a couple of examples from this book. The small one is uh, The Good Parts by Douglas Crockford. And um, this is probably like 150 pages book from Raleigh. It gives you a brief overview of the language itself, of all these good and bad decisions that were put inside the language or implemented inside the language uh, as uh, Doug Crockford sees it. 
If you like large books, I, I recommend you the book by David Flanagan. It's like 1,500 pages book. Its sixth edition is um, it's pretty good about everything. It's about the language itself. It'll talk about the web browsers and um, Ajax also is covered there. So it's a solid, solid book. There are many other uh, good authors. One of them I mentioned already, his name is Larry Ullman. Uh, you can use, uh, I think his title is called uh, Modern JavaScript. So I would recommend you these books. There's plenty of uh, documentation. You can go to the Mozilla site. And the, anyway, there are so many uh, reading materials out there, so you won't be disappointed. In general, I can tell you that JavaScript community is huge. People write, people blog, people give examples. So it's a nice environment to be in. Having said that, I want to warn every project manager who is used to a different environment and is moving to JavaScript. When you create um, project plans and when you do estimates on how long does development part take, just in case multiply it by two. It's slower. Development with JavaScript is slower, given the fact that compilers are not, not helping you, the language is dynamic, and um, just to be on the safe side, multiply everything by two if you can. That's about it. Thank you for coming. Again, my name is Jakob Fein. I work for Farta Systems. This is our site, and you can reach us over there easily. Thanks a lot.